Uh, and this is some work done with a couple of collaborators of mine, between Dan Neff and Christine Nichols. So the single star evolution uh, for producing planetary nebulae is, as we all know, uh, the star moves up the uh, AGB, uh, you have a strong wind up here uh, that uh, dissipates the envelope of the star, uh, the central star and remnant uh, moves across here, uh, becomes very hot, ionizes the nebula, uh, and you produce a planetary nebula by a single star. Now, in the binary uh, evolution scenario, uh, you have a close by binary, and at some stage on the AGB, uh, the um, star fills its Roche low, you have a common envelope event, uh, and that produces a, a tight binary, or perhaps a merged star as a result of that. Uh, the point of this is that the star uh, terminates its evolution on the AGB or even the RGB uh, earlier than it would do in the single star case. And immediately before this happens, we have what I'm talking about here, the immediate precursor of this particular uh, case would be here. Now remember that this can occur anywhere along the uh, AGB or the RGB, so immediate precursors actually exist all the way up and down uh, the giant branch. So how do we find these things? Now if we consider uh, a star, a red giant in a binary system, as the star evolves up the uh, giant branch, it gets bigger and bigger, and its shape becomes uh, more and more distorted uh, and as it fills or almost fills its road slow. And the road, this thing is a, an orbital system, and so the shape we see uh, changes all the time, and uh, that gives us a variability for these stars. And this is quite a prolonged uh, evolutionary phase. Once you fill the Roche load and you have the common envelope event, uh, that's very brief. You'd be extremely uh, lucky to see that actually happen. But in this particular phase of evolution, we have something called ellipsoidal variability uh, caused by the red giant almost filling its row So it's just about to turn into a, a binary system that uh, goes through the common end by the event. So how do we find these things? It turns out that if uh, you look at large systems like the LMC or the SMC or the Galactic Bulge as Macho and Ogle have done, and you plot up period luminosity laws for red giant stars, you find that there's a group of stars down here in a kind of a loose sequence called sequence E uh, that in fact are these ellipsoidal variables. And they're about 1% of the luminous red giants. And here's some light curves of these stars. Uh, on the right here is just magnitude versus time and these are the fold of light curves on the left. So uh, you can see here, this is a, a pair of eclipsing red giants. I mean, those things are really, really rare. Uh, this is a close binary red giant system. There are many systems, the most common ones are these sinusoidal variabilities. And then there are a few rather strange looking light curves like these ones here. It turns out that those are in fact eccentric binaries. So the absolute test for an ellipsoidal vari variable uh, is that the, uh, if you have a velocity curve and a light curve, you get two cycles of the light curve for one cycle of the uh, velocity curve. And that's because red giants are more or less the same temperature uh, all over. And if you have a shape like that, uh, when it's side on, uh, it has the maximum area uh, that you can uh, see apparently, and so that gives you the maximum luminosity. And when that's gone through, through 180 degrees, it would be another maximum. Uh, when it's gone through 90 degrees, you'll be looking end on, and so you'll see a minimum apparent area. So uh, that gives you then uh, two minima and two maxima uh, per oral period. So that's the absolute test, that's how we know that those sequence E stars are in fact uh, ellipsoidal variable red 
giants. So, what can we do with this? Well, in the LMC and the SMC, but we'll just stick with the LMC, uh, we've had these surveys for tens of years with uh, Macho and Oval, and they found thousands of these red giants. We've also had uh, surveys by Tunas and uh, the uh, SAGE survey of the LMC, so we know the exact number of red giants of all types uh, in the LMC. And by <coughs> modelling the populations of sequence E stars relative to red giants, we can find out the rate of production of binary planetary nebulae by these uh, merger events. And so uh, that's what's been done here. And the advantage of doing this rather than just taking a main sequence binary fraction and, and doing all those calculations is that we're looking at the immediate precursors, we're only looking at those binaries with the appropriate uh, parameters uh, to produce the uh, binary planetary nebulae. So the kind of modeling that we've done here, we, we calibrate uh, our model uh, by reproducing the number amplitude and the number period distribution of the sequencing uh, red giant variables. And the output of one of the uh, things that's of importance here is the uh, fraction of uh, binaries or planet, the rate of production of single and binary planetary nebulae in the LMC. There are lots of other outputs as well. Uh, we do this by taking a million uh, stars and that with appropriate uh, parameters, minor systems and single systems, uh, and do a Monte Carlo model. So the kind of input you need is the initial mass function, star formation history of the LMC, evolution rates on the RGB and AGB, various binary statistics, uh, although because we're using the uh, stars that are actually the immediate precursors, the actual uh, nature of these uh, initial mass ratios and initial periods are not that important. Uh, we need some kind of mass loss, uh, tidal effects uh, for how the binaries uh, evolve, uh, something about common, eject uh, common envelope ejections and mergers, so the ratio of uh, mergers to uh, ejections, <coughs> the mergers are pretty uh, fair on the AGB, and then something to generate the light curves um, and like uh, programs to do that uh, exist. So here's our calibrations. Uh, just looking at the uh, oval data, which is the best, uh, the black curve here gives the number versus the amplitude, light amplitude, uh, for the sequence E variables, and the light grey curve there is uh, the model fit. And down here, uh, for amplitudes less than about 0.03 magnitudes, uh, we're obviously uh, missing lots of those objects. So we're only fitting uh, the stars with larger amplitudes, larger than 0.03 uh, magnitudes. And similarly for the macho data, the macho data is not as good as the oval data, but we have a, a fit here. This is the uh, fit to the number period distribution. Uh, the red curve is the observed distribution, uh, the blue dotted curve is the oval uh, fit, and you can see that's extremely good. Uh, the macho curve is a little bit uh, lower there, but it's still a reasonably good fit to the data. So some of the output, uh, you get the uh, output uh, or the uh, masses of the stars that are actually going through this uh, Common envelope uh, event, and I should say that the LMC had a burst of star formation that started something like 4 or 10 to the 9 years ago and went through a few times 10 to the 8 years ago, so you get this big burst uh, or, or excess number of stars here, around 1.6 solar masses, and you get the masses of the remnants, these are the non interacting binaries of single stars, the usual 0.6 solar mass planetary nebula nucleus. The uh, remnants for the uh, merged binaries have lower masses, and even uh, you can get uh, RGB mergers, or, or sorry, uh, common envelope events, because the, you know, depending on the, um, 
the, the separation of the binary system, uh, the, uh, the uh, common envelope event can occur anywhere on the RGB. So that's the kind of output you get. Uh, okay. And uh, I guess the important thing here is that you get a birth rate of planetary nebulae arising from close binary interactions uh, is about 7 to 9 percent of the total PN birth rate. Now observations of uh, binary PN tend to be somewhat larger than this, but that's not a problem because if you look at post AGB stars, say, you find that the photospheres of those stars, and these are binary post, uh, post AGB stars, are devoid of refractory elements. So they've got lots of re accreted uh, mass on them. And if you re accrete mass, you hold up the evolution rate for post AGB stars. If that goes through the planetary nebula phase, uh, your binary will evolve slower than the single star uh, planetary nebula nucleus. And so you can you know, get these to agree uh, quite well. And you don't need to accrete much mass in order to do this. And then you could say, you know, if you say that binaries with periods less than 500 years, uh, can shape the nebula, produce elliptical nebulae, you find out that about 25% um, of planetaries would be affected uh, by the binary companion. Now implicit in this, these numbers is the assumption that all singular wide binary AGB stars produce a PN, and some people uh, don't like that. Um, but because we've got the number of uh, Planetary nebulae in the LMC. Uh, Quentin and his group have, have got this uh, number that he's observed. Uh, we know exactly, you know, the number of red giants in the LMC, and there's 58,000 in the top uh, one magnitude of the RGB uh, in, the, in the 25 degrees. We know from our model the evolution rate of these things, so we get the birth rate of stars onto the RGB. If we take a PM lifetime of two by ten to fourth years. Uh, we get a birth rate here, or, or the number of PN in the IC should be that, and the fortuitously good uh, agreement there is amazing, and the uh, outcome really is that most PN arise from single star mass loss, or perhaps wide binaries. Now, the important thing about these, or one of the interesting things about these uh, stars, the ellipsoidal variables, is that if you get a radial velocity curve, you can actually get the mass, the mass ratio, you can find all the binary parameters for the system and we're doing that for about 100 of these things. Uh, I'll show here uh, the results for 67 uh, that we've completed so far. Uh, you see there's a peak here around 1.6 old mass is in the mass for the primary and the mass ratio looks something like this and if you compare that to the model um, you see once again the model has a big peak here uh, it's somewhat more pointed than the actual observed uh, mass ratio, which probably means the, uh, uh, the burst uh, of star formation in the LMC wasn't as uh, big as we assumed, and the mass ratio is sort of pretty well uh, as predicted. So, I'll just leave the summary there. Okay, thank you. For your companion models, did you use already involved stars as possible companions? Already uh, yeah, there, there are some double degenerates in the system, uh, but they tend to merge lower down in RGB because they've already been through a common envelope. So those are included in your set of numbers? Yeah, they're a very small fraction. Uh, they don't really produce many binary planetary nebulae. Okay, by themselves. Because we observe about a quarter of all the closer binaries from the WHO. Thank you. Yes, the. Okay.
Mr. Speaker, you 